Nobody knows where they are. <laughs> Dad's in Florida. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, what's the next holiday coming up on the calendar? Valentine. I agree. You will celebrate it. So, Debbie Downer statistic of the morning. I apologize. Uh, what time of year do most separations, breakups, and divorces happen? Before Valentine's Day. Before and around Valentine's Day. What a wonderful holiday. <clears throat> so, in the spirit of that, we're going to talk about marriage tips. Now, not everybody's married in here, but that's not exactly what I mean. We're going to talk about marriage tips. If my clicker's going to work, the battery's real bad now. You want to help me with that? You want to click it for me? The batteries are really bad, I'm saying. If I do this, it helps. Marriage tips for the bride of Christ. Men, I'm sorry if you feel emasculated, but you are a bride, so to speak. I think it's working now, Leland. Sweet. All right. So we are the bride. Christ is the groom. Scripture talks a lot about this. And there's a lot of things that we can acknowledge in Scripture concerning being this bride of Christ. This, this is an intimate relationship that Jesus wants with us. You know, my wife has gone today. I miss her a lot. But the kids are barfing and all kinds of stuff. Right? But do we have that kind of relationship with Christ? You know, if I talk to my wife once a week for 10 minutes, how well do you think my relationship is going to be? Not good? She might think something's up. How often is that the length of time we spend talking to Christ? Maybe less than that? Maybe more than that? So some things to consider when we're thinking about our relationship with Christ. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you so much uh, for those that are here and get to spend time in your word, Lord. I pray that uh, I deliver your word um, the way you want it to be delivered for your will so that we can learn from your word, uh, so that our hearts can be convicted and encouraged. Uh, I pray for those who are not able to be here today, Lord. Uh, we love them. We miss them. Uh, those who are in uh, hospitals or uh, enduring illness, Father, we just pray for quick healing for them. We sure miss our family when they're not here, Lord. So we pray that they can return and uh, we'll get to spend that fellowship time with them. So, Lord, I just pray, uh, as I know you already have, just bless this time as we spend together this morning. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So if we're going to talk about marriage tips for the bride of Christ, we first need to know that we're faithfully loved. I didn't propose to my wife in a very romantic way. What? I won't even tell you the story. <clears throat> it's that bad. But if she didn't think that I loved her, she wouldn't have said yes. Right? Because I didn't have money. Like, I wasn't like, you know, this baller, and she was like, oh, I can totally just be taken care of forever. No, she knew that I would care for her, that I loved her, right? So if we're going to think about being this bride of Christ, then we need to first understand that we are faithfully loved by Christ. Lots of examples. We're going to look at four. First John 4, 8 through 10 says, God is love. God doesn't just have love, but he is love. Not worldly love, not what a lot of us look at as love in the world now, but this really true definition of love, that is who God is. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his son, his one and only son, into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for us. So God's love is action. He's not just giving us lip service, but he's delivering on that love, sacrificially in the most ultimate way. What I think is interesting and, and pretty crucial for God's love, not that we love God, see, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us first. See, God's love for us isn't dependent on us. That's pretty amazing. He loves us even though we don't deserve it. He loves us even though we cheat on him. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his own, only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Here's some examples of what the Bible uses as far as love words, the New Testament being wrote in Greek. Eros is a Greek word for love. Uh, we don't see it in the New Testament, but in the Greek language it 
refers to a physical, passionate love between spouses. A storge love, this is the type of love signifying the natural affection between family members. You love your kids, love your aunt and uncle. This word appears occasionally in the New Testament. Phileo love, the Greek word of love, uh, signifies the love between friends or brotherly love. And then we get to agape love. This Greek word for love is by far the one that appears most frequently in the New Testament. This means to love unconditionally, to love the undeserving, despite disappointment and rejection. You see, in these scriptures, that's the word that was originally used in the Greek language. God's love is unconditional love. It doesn't depend on us. It is this agape love because we are faithfully loved by our groom. Revelation 19, 7 through 9 says, Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. So we're invited, but I wonder how often we're, we're looking at this relationship like a marriage relationship. It takes work, right? It takes communication. If I married my wife, said I do, and then stopped talking to her, we're driving to Branson, Missouri, that's where we had our honeymoon, and she's trying to talk to me, oh, it's exciting, it's our wedding day, and I'm just like, mm -hmm. So we get there to the hotel, Oh, man, this is so nice. This is such a nice hotel. Mm -hmm. What's she going to start feeling? Yeah. I, maybe I made a mistake. <clears throat> this guy's kind of strange. Oh, maybe it's just first wedding day jitters. The next morning, oh, good morning. Hey. <laughs> whole day at work. Whole honeymoon, just, just weird non-communication for me. And then we're driving home. and I'm like, man, yeah, I don't really talk to my wife. This whole honeymoon, I, brought, I, I better talk to her a little bit. Hey, Lacey, uh, you know, I realize I've been distant. But, uh, you know, let's talk for a couple minutes. So we talk. I'm like, okay, I, I got to go back in my head and, and do what I was doing. Hmm. I'm thinking she's not going to be interested anymore. God's not that way, but we treat him that way a lot of times. Oh, hey, God, let's talk for five minutes. Let's not really spend any quality time together. Let's just, you know, get in a quick five-minute talk session and I'm back to doing my thing, my life. <clears throat> we don't treat it so much like a marriage relationship, like we're the bride of Christ. We treat it more like a, a casual Facebook acquaintance a lot of times. But God's invited us. He's invited us to the supper of the Lamb. He's invited us to be with Him. He's preparing a place for us, like an excited groom waiting for his wedding. He's rejoicing over us. He wants to be with us, completely with us. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is a picture of God's heart for us. The depth and intimacy and the relationship he wants with us. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Probably a lot of you guys have been in relationships that didn't work out, right? Maybe you were the one that got rejected. Really sucked, right? Wasn't fun. God doesn't ever do that. God never rejects us. Never leaves us. Loves us unconditionally. No matter what. Now, what we do, right? His love doesn't depend on what we do, but what we do does determine our relationship with him. Are we going to reciprocate that intimate love that he's rejoicing and wants from us? Or is it just going to be, hey, I haven't talked to you in a while, God. Five minutes later, okay, I got to go. Second Peter 3, 8 through 9. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord... A day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, 
as some understand slowness, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone, everyone to come to repentance. He wants to know all of us in this way, in this deep, intimate, relational way. But he leaves us the option, right? We can respond to that because he's invited us. I've used this example a lot, but if I first met my wife, she didn't know who I was, I walked up to her and I grabbed her hand and said, hey, you're my wife, let's go. Club you on the head and drag you behind me like a caveman. How do you think she'd respond to that? Those of you who know her, she would probably smack me in the face and say, get out of here, you creep. She wouldn't just go along with it, right? God's the same way. He invites us into a deep relationship with him. Because that's how relationships work. It can't be forced. It has to be encouraged. It has to be built. It has to grow. Do we trust that we have a faithful groom faithfully loving us? Now as fickle as we are and can be in our relationship with God, he's still merciful. And don't raise your hand, but if you've experienced um, adultery on either side, that's a, that's a terrible thing. It's a rough thing. How often are we adulterers against God? He's still merciful. Hmm. Jeremiah 2 the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord. This scripture kind of reminds us of the beginnings of our faith. Maybe you're baptized at church camp. A church camp is like a big spiritual high and, and all this stuff. And you get baptized. David mentioned, I think in Sunday school, some folks, you know, they'll get baptized and you never see them again. We have to cultivate that relationship. We gotta communicate with our bridegroom as us being the bride of Christ to keep that passion alive, keep that relationship growing. Second Corinthians 11, one through four says, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. Do bear with me. For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Well, this is what happened to us if we've neglected that relationship with Jesus. We've been led astray by something. Even our own earthly marriage relationship, if it takes precedence over our relationship with Christ, this is not what God's designed. You guys ever seen that triangle where God's at the top, husband and wife are down here? They can get closer to each other, right? But they don't necessarily get closer to God. If they both get closer to God, they're going to get closer to each other. Yeah. That's, that's the marriage relationship. It's all tied into one. So we have to feel this Conviction in our heart, knowing that there's things that is that are leading us astray. What is leading me away from my relationship with God? Maybe it's not the big social outcast sins that look real ugly on the surface. Maybe it's just busyness, not having priorities. Maybe it's not fully trusting that God has a better plan than I do for my life. Where's that pure devotion, that sincere, pure devotion? What's leading me astray? One of my favorite passages of scripture. I would encourage you to read the whole, the whole book. We're just going to have a snapshot today. But Hosea chapter 1, 2 through 3. If you haven't read this, uh, really listen up. It says, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom. I don't say whoredom ever. Okay, but he's saying prostitute, right? Go find a prostitute wife. God told him to. Go take yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. 
God told Hosea to go find a prostitute and marry her. This is a follower of God. He's trying to speak a message through Hosea to the people. So to do that, he says, go find a prostitute and marry her. Hard command. Hosea must have been a strong man for God to call him to do this. So he does. He finds Gomer. They end up having three children. And it wasn't like, you know, hey, now you're married to me and I'm a fixer kind of husband. And I've, I've fixed your old life and we're just a happy couple. No, she just keeps going back to it. Just keeps going back to prostitution. Leland, there's a video if you want to show it. This is after she's gone back. So part of God's story is not the worst time people saw. Paul was sick today. He was supposed to do community meditation. No. That was his video. My Lord God, how can I love one who loves another? Why did you want me to marry her? She has been unfaithful so many times. I know now how your heart grieves over your people that have abandoned you. So how can you still love us? How? How? Style. 
prostituting herself, even though she was married to Hosea. And that, that lifestyle had taken her back uh, and down so far that she was about to be sold as a slave. She was already Hosea's wife. They already belonged to each other. Why would he have to buy her back? But he did. This is how Christ reconciles us back to God. Although we stray, although we go on these other paths that we think are better, are going to suit us, going to make us happy, and prostitute ourselves out to the things of the world, God still absolutely loves us. He, he did pay the ultimate price, didn't he? Yes. Far more than 15 pieces of silver. So if this is true, you believe this, you have a relationship with Christ, but maybe you don't see it and haven't viewed it as this marriage relationship like he does. Well, let's do something about it. Let's strengthen our marriage. Hebrews 13 says, marriage should be honored by all. Now this is talking about marriage between an earthly husband and wife, but it also applies to our bride of Christ relationship. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Just one example, this love of money, we see it in society. We see it as, oh, this is success. This is what success looks like. This is what your life path needs to be on. I'll choose my school, I'll choose my career, I'll choose lots of things because I think it'll make me a lot of money. And not just money, but all those decisions surrounding money so easily become our God. So easily become the thing we marry ourselves to. Married to your job, married to your career, married to your bank account. But it's God before our money. So some things not to do, some don'ts. And here's some do's. We kind of talked about this a little bit already. Communication. If we want to strengthen our marriage relationship with God, we need to talk. Now, we're praying here together multiple times during service. And corporate prayer is good. It's talked about in Scripture. But something we need to be doing, and I'm sure we are, when you pray, Christ tells us, go into your room. Shut the door. Pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Mark 1, 35, example of Jesus praying alone in solitude. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Matthew 14, 23, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. Luke 6, 12, one of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. You ever have those long, long conversations with someone? Builds your relationship, doesn't it? You, you get out all the stuff that's more than just chit-chat, small talk. Starts to get deep, starts to get real. Lacey and I struggle a lot of times finding time to talk to each other and just spend together. So a lot of times we try to go to bed early, early when the kids do, so we can get up like four, drink coffee, and sit at the table and talk. And man, my day's so much better because we can spend that time together. Christ wants that from us as well. He wants that one-on-one -on -one devotion time. How are we going to strengthen our marriage? Galatians 2.20 I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, us and Christ are becoming one. He's living in us through his Holy Spirit. This is, this is that full oneness that we're striving for. He's preparing a place for us so one day when he comes and takes us back to be with him, we completely are with him in his presence. Isn't that what it says about marriage? This mystery of two becoming one? With Christ, it's even deeper than that. It's on a spiritual level. I can't have that with my wife. It doesn't exist with my wife. Only through Christ and his Holy Spirit can I have that kind of connection? Am I trying to strengthen my relationship with him? To have that? 
John 14, 1 through 3 says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. Last month, we, we talked about Maranatha. Are we praying for Christ's return? Are we excited for that complete oneness with God? Revelation 21, 2, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself, God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. This is the full covenant coming to 100% of our marriage relationship with God. And this is the vision that was given. As it's all happening. Where does that voice come from? What does it say? From the throne. In a loud voice. All right, you see where it says, look? Who's sitting on the throne? He says that in a loud voice. Read this with me from look. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Let's pray. Father, I look forward to this day. I look forward to your return. I pray that I'm not so easily distracted by this world and busyness. And, and just time spent away from you, Lord. Help me through your word this morning to move my heart to make more time for you, to spend that alone time with you, and not just for five, ten minutes, but real time with you, Lord. You're calling for it. You're preparing a place for me, Lord. Help me to see that you are this faithful Father unconditional love merciful father I pray that this strengthening in my relationship with you Lord becomes a bigger priority in my life help me to set aside things that distract me help me to set aside things that aren't part of your will Lord and I pray that I can encourage my brothers and sisters to do the same we can encourage each other as we strengthen this relationship with you father we thank you for these blessings this morning as we learn from your word and as we go out in, uh, into our homes or to work or wherever we're going, Lord. Help us to remember and, and hide these words in our heart and keep them with us. Let your Holy Spirit guide us on our way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.